is the trading day after the budget presentation by President Bola Tinubu. Good morning, good evening. Wherever the world you're watching from is Business Morning coming to you live from Channels HQ um, right here in Lagos. Let's get the top stories that set um, your agenda now. The Central Bank has directed all its branches to continue issuing and accepting all denominations of the old and redesigned Naira banknotes uh, to and from deposit money banks in the country. In a statement released, the financial market regulator says the move is in compliance with the order of the Supreme Court granting the prayers of the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation to extend the use of the old banknotes beyond the December the 31st, 2023 um, deadline for their validity. At the same time, the CBN has asked the public to continue accepting both versions of the Naira notes for their daily transactions while embracing other alternative modes of payment to reduce uh, pressure on cash circulation. And the Minister of Finance and Coordinating Economy, Mr. Wale Edu, says in order to stabilize the Nigerian economy for rapid, inclusive growth, there's going to be less reliance on borrowing. Mr. Edu stated this during the breakdown of the 2024 budget proposal by the Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, Mr. Abubakar Bagudu in Abuja. He adds that the budget deficit has been brought down from 6.1% of GDP to about 3.88%. Our correspondent, Benny Ark, reports. A few hours after President Bola Tinubu presented his first budget estimates to the National Assembly, the Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning gives a breakdown of the proposals. The Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Mr. Wale Adum, gives more insights on the assumptions in the budget and explains why the federal government wants to reduce borrowing. In order to stabilize the Nigerian economy for rapid, inclusive growth, there is going to be less reliance on borrowing. The budget deficit is being brought down from about um, six over six percent, six point one percent of GDP to three point eight eight percent of GDP. That's a huge change in direction from unlimited and limitless borrowing to focusing on revenue expenditure management to give value for money with expenditure and to raise revenue. The Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, Mr. Atiku Bagudu, presents the sectoral breakdown of the budget. According to the Minister, Defense and Security, Education, Health, Infrastructure and Social Development and Poverty Reduction are the top five allocations. The debt servicing is expected to gulp 9.18 trillion naira. The minister explains that the budget is designed to address fiscal challenges and improve domestic economic situations. The budget that was presented today to the National Assembly and I believe was well received by the National Assembly and Nigerians has been prepared against the backdrop of continuing global and domestic challenges. Overall fiscal risks have increased following weaker than expected domestic economy performance and structural issues in the domestic economy. A review of the 2023 budget reveals that only 25% of the capital budget has been released as of September 2023. Mr. Ben Akabweze gives further insight into the plans of the new administration. This is a transition year. We're tr transiting from one president to another. The last time we had a transition year like that was 2015. In 2015, the budget was not presented until actually mid-December. You know, so one month later than we are doing even uh, now. The administration is hoping that the budget will meet the expectations of Nigerians and improve the nation's gross domestic product. Benny Ark, Channels Television News. All right, there you have it. The Renewed Hope Appropriation Bill has been presented there, 27.5 trillion naira. That's a projected uh, expenditure. Estimated revenue, 18.32 um, trillion naira. Uh, joining us now is Mr. Bismarck Rwani, CEO of the Natural Directives Company. Great to have you again, <laughs> sir. Good morning. Good morning. It's the morning after, you know, the presentation. And uh, I, I'm sure it's, it's lived up to the hype. 
yes. you know, at this point. And uh, before we get into it, I, I remember one of the arguments for taking out uh, fuel subsidy was to relieve pressure on our revenue. Yes. Subsidy is gone, gone. Yes. But at this time, we're still seeing a huge deficit there, nine trillion. What do you think? Now you've got to look at it relatively. The budget deficit last year was six, over 6% 6 of GDP. You're bringing it down to 4% of GDP. I think that is remarkable. It's, you must give credit. In any case, the budget was crafted by Mr. Budget himself. Ben Akabwe has been on it, so you don't get better than that. So in terms of its crafting, in terms of its direction, in terms of the goals, I think that's, there's no doubt about the fact that uh, a good job was done, right? But so then, if, the, if the subsidy was still there? Oh, then it would, you would have been at 7%, if not 8% of GDP. Of GDP. Yeah, but the comfort zone for regional integration and most parts of the world is 3% of GDP, right? So you've gone from 6% of GDP to 4%. Move it directionally, you're okay, but the target is to make it go that way. If you didn't have uh, this, when you say subsidies, sub first of all, subsidies have not gone. Okay. Subsidies have been reduced. Uh, but the subsidies are not just in PMS and petrol, but they're also in the exchange rate. So you've taken part of that and taken part of this, and then you begin to do other things. But we'll get to that. Um, what's my understanding of the budget? The budget basically is a financial plan. And like the slides will show you, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Right. All right, so that's one. Two is that you address how much have you earned, or how much you project. First of all, how much you project to spend, how much you project to earn, what's the deficit, how do you fund the deficit, and what's the, as a tool of economic management, becomes a critical issue. So let's take it, what are the basic assumptions of this budget? Assumption number one, first of all, you want to grow at 3.67, I think, uh, which is higher than the rate of population growth. But if you, if you, if you actually uh, put this in the context of what the president wants to accomplish, a $1 trillion economy in eight years, which means that you should be growing at about almost 8%. Your projected growth rate this year is half of what your goals are. So there's still work to be done in terms of making people realize that this is, this is a very steep hill to climb, right? And I do not think that you're gonna to get to 8% growth this year. As a matter of fact, if you get 4%, that's fair enough. Assumption number two is that inflation will be at about 21%, right? I think that's, that's achievable. Inflation today is about 27, 28. It, in the month of December, it will go up slightly, right? So if you, if you can achieve 21% at the end of next year, then I think that's achievable. There's no doubt about it. 21%, even though it's, it's still a really high number, number. but you know, but you are 30. If you can bring it down to 21%, you've done That's a lot. That's fantastic. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Can, we, can we for that uh, uh, you know, to, to happen? And, you know, also, you have to understand what is the exchange rate assumption. There are two major assumptions when we have to talk about it. The exchange rate assumption is that it's at 750 Naira to a dollar. Today, the Naira is trading at about 1,150. Okay, so you have a long way to go. Is it achievable? I'm sure that you will move towards your purchasing power parity value, which is about almost 800, right? But it takes time, and you have to do a lot of work. In other words, you have to restructure your foreign exchange market. You have to have an open auction system. You have to move all the cobwebs uh, so that people are not taking gaming the system. Because there's part, part of it gaming, part of it short supply, part of it restrictions. So you've got to do all of this to make the exchange rate come into what we call the real effective exchange rate path. You know, you need, you need to, there's work to be done. But that's, that's part of the monetary policy uh, um, functions, which comes out of the central bank and, right? As far as fiscal policy are concerned, let us look at the budget itself. In, it has grown. The amount to be spent has grown by 25%. It, it never in, comes down, really. No, 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 that's fine. The, the higher, the better. But it, it's what you do with the money. Right. And the impact it has on the people. But when you, if you dollarize and you, you put this budget, in, if you convert it to dollars, the actual amount spent is 14% less than what it, what it was spent two years ago. 
So in reality, we are walking our way down the ladder of success, right? But how is, how is currency devaluation playing into all of that? No, because there is a, there's a potential, you know, because when you are comparing countries, you're not going to be comparing Naira with Rand and CD. You've got to bring it to a standard. Right. And so when you look at budgets all over the world, they compare them and they, they grow. But in Nigeria, actually, this is only federal, right? There are state activities. So when you add the state activities to each country, about 40, 48% or 46% or total budget. So let us double it and say that 27 trillion times two, let's say 50 trillion or 51 trillion is the total spend. Your GDP is over two, has about 230 trillion. Your the government expenditure alone is not going to move the needle. You need private investment, and private investment is a function of confidence. Confidence is a function of clarity, right, and coming clean. So you need to, you need to get this done. When and the two investment multipliers, that is government investment multiplier and private sector investment multiplier, will have a multiplier effect on outcomes, that is GDP. And the GDP is driven by two major things. One, injections, which money that comes in and optimal use of that injection. And two, leakages, money that goes out. If the leakages are more than the injections, or then you have a negative outcome. And so, Leakages, you know, genuine leakages and unofficial leakages. So that's something else. But the reality is that the budget as a tool of economic management, if you look at it, over the past years, last in the last three years, and we take it one by one, we said we will grow at 4.2. We actually grew at 3.25. We said we will grow last year at 3.75. We grew at 2.54. Right? We said the oil price will be 57. The oil, actual oil price was 98. We said the oil price would be 75. The actual oil price was 83. But this year, we are using $77 as our benchmark price. $77, you know that Brent today is at 80, 80, right? What you normally do in a plan like this is to say you give yourself enough headroom. You can't be that optimistic. The, even on the day of the OPEC meeting, when we are squabbling about you know, output, the, cost. uh, output cuts. So let us assume that the price drops sharply because something happens to $74 a barrel. And your benchmark price for the year is at 77 You are already underwater. So should we be going towards 60 Yes, you must give yourself at least $15 room, right? And dampen the appetite of your legislators and everybody. Don't, don't create a crisis of false expectation because people begin to get excited for no reason. This economy uh, is a fragile state. So we need to focus and make sure that we, 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 we come clean um, to the people. Uh, I think that is one of the key elements. Key, key things. But looking at the, the, the 10th Assembly, you, you know, at this time, now it's been presented. Yes. What are you expecting? Well, Turkey's don't vote for Christmas. So I think you are throwing blood into... Sea of sharks, right? So if they if they take seventy seven, they will say, okay, let's make it eighty or eighty one, right? If you if you say you want to spend twenty seven trillion, they will say let's spend thirty trillion. There's no harm in that, but how are you going to fund it, and what is the impact going to be? Look, and I was talking about the, the budget as a tool of economic management, not just balancing books. Look, the exchange rate target in twenty twenty two was four hundred and ten. You know the actual exchange rate that year. 740. You can't have a, a variance of 100% no, in big, any budget. Yeah. Then it gets better and interesting. In 2023, the budget, the, last year when President Buhari was announcing the budget, his exchange rate assumption was 435. You know what? It, uh, we close the year at 1,158. We are 300% out variance. So here we are at 750, right? Uh, I don't expect it to, to, to be too varied, but we should look at what history has taught us, because those who don't learn from history are bound to repeat the mistakes of the past, right? So what would you say is the safe uh, benchmark for the exchange rate at this point? I, I would turn more towards, it's better to under-promise and over-achieve, right? I would turn more towards uh, something 
Maybe like a thousand I, number. No, no, I, I'm not going to, because the media will carry that. Right. Uh, Mr. Ravana said it, a thousand. <laughs> so I would turn more towards the, where the market is trading. But if you, if you reform the system and have an auction system, quite frankly, I won't be surprised if it comes down to about 800, 850 about that. Yeah, we've it, also got projections for December yes. uh, from uh, JP Morgan. I think yeah. they were looking at about 850 for December. Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen that, but I'm just, uh, I'm, you know, I'm speculating. Exactly. I'm saying that it could, it could come. But, 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 but another major issue, you know, right now, we've racked up a lot of debt yes. in the last couple of years, and this government is still going to go borrowing. No, I think Mr. Waled said no. He said no know. borrowing, no, but yeah. uh, no. let's just hope. Hopefully, we don't have no, to. No, if, if, if beggars, you know, if wishes were horses, beggars were right. Right. The, the reality, reality is that one, you must reschedule your existing debt. You must reschedule. You must come to terms with your creditors. You must come to terms with your multilateral lenders to clean up this thing. We have the mental adjustment to make Nigerians realize that we're not a rich country and we can't be living like sheikhs and, you know, borrowed money, right? So we now need to come clean, right? But to come clean means you have to be clean to come clean. You, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. So I think that it's, it's achievable, but there's hard work to be done. The hard work is more mental than fiscal. And uh, I think... We're on the path. There are, right. there are a few people there that know, know what to do. And, and, you know, also looking at this debt issue at this time, yes. we, we've racked up a lot, and we've not seen that, you know, when it comes to um, development. So I'm wondering in my mind, is there a way we can create some kind of hedge for Nigeria, for the people of Nigeria, against... All the debt our government rack up. Can we get no, some kind of no, no. insurance? Let's, you know, let's, going let's, forward. let's understand debt. You see, people, the amount of debt is not the problem, right? It is what you've done with the debt that you are, you know, if you, if you borrow to go to the casino, then you know what your problem. If you borrow to consume, or if you borrow to build assets which increase productivity, then you will have, you will have benefits. But it is not a debt, it is a debt service. The debt service this year is 45% of revenue compared to when it was 75% and it had even gone up to 95%. So directionally, you must give credit to the people who crafted this to say, yes, they want, they want to move in the right direction. Do they have the capacity to move in the right direction? We've, we've gotten ready and all of that, but we are trying to run a 100-meter dash, but we have weights on our feet. So we've got to get rid of those you know, weights that we have tied around our ankles before we can run, you cannot, you cannot go far or go fast if you don't get rid of those. And those things, whether we like it or not, we have weights on our, on our feet. We must get rid of those things. That's, that's the thing. And in the end, it's budgetary, budgetary arithmetic, budgetary mathematics and economics is of no use to anybody except when, by this time, six months' time, if we are buying rice at 40,000 a bag rather than 60,000 a bag, if we are buying bread at one, 900 naira a big loaf instead of 1,300, which we are doing today, if we are buying beans and gari at lower prices, then the people begin to say, the people no, are not interested in uh, whether the budget is balanced and what the debt is. They, how does it affect their day-to-day -day livelihood? That is the key thing. And as you know, prices are up, but also incomes are down. And people are under tremendous pressure. It's, you will notice that on the streets of in Lagos in particular, the number of lunatics you see have increased, and part of it driven by poverty. Right, mental health issues. Mental is Politics health issues. And yeah, people are pushed to the wall. Yeah, mental and, health. and you see them all over the place. Some of them walking across the road, even in moving, moving traffic, because they've lost hope. So, all right. So, 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 so Mr. <coughs> looking at this, um, it's called the renewed hope, you know, appropriation. Bill. Does it does it inspire hope? For you, <laughs> uh, no, I, looking I, at I, the breakdown, I think the name, the manifesto of the government, this election was renewed hope. Renewed hope. So uh, I think that it's uh, that just a manifesto. It's a nomenclature. It doesn't matter what. The like I said, the most important thing is not hope. Hope is not a strategy, mind you. Right. Right. It's, it's you know so. 
the truth is that people need to feel the impact. And you do not do, you, you, the impact is not going to be felt because of 10 or 12 percent of GDP, that is 27 trillion era. It has to be more. And where is the more going to come from? The more is going to come from investors. Investors are going to come here when they are sure that the one, the money is safe and the environment is clean and things, you can look forward to a, a brighter future. That is work in progress. It's not going to be done like a light switch. We are going to have to see it, right? We have to feel it. And we have to be honest with ourselves. And that's the big thing. Honesty is in short supply. And, and, and at this point, uh, Nigerians uh, seem really giddy, you know, at this time. Yeah, they want to see action. Absolutely. They, they want to feel the impact. They either, you see, one thing, you can, fake, you can fake news, but you can't fake prosperity. You can't, people cannot start pretending to be happy. You know, it won't take long before the smiles will turn to tears. So, so much. So much wipe, to do. You have to wipe out so, wipe so the tears off people. And we're definitely watching the breakdown. You know, yeah. at this point, where no, sure these monies are going. No, Ben Akabuzi, is, uh, Mr. Budget himself, he knows exactly. the numbers, and uh, you, could, you don't have a better hand, better set of hands uh, to do that. Fantastic. We're hoping, we're hoping for the very best. Thank you so much. Always great having your perspective, Mr. Bismarck Ruani, CEO of Financial Derivatives Company. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we'll take a moment now. When we come back, we'll drill down on the spending direction. That's in a moment. Do stay with us. Uh, passage of the 2024 appropriation bill. Let's get a sense of where the 27 uh, trillion will be spent. Joining us now is uh, Mr. Idris Schreiber, economist, uh, joining me right here in the studio. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Great and to thanks have you. for having me. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm sure you saw the uh, budget breakdown yesterday. You know, that came out yesterday. So we got a glimpse of where some of these spending, you know, will be going to. Uh, talk to me about um, uh, spending. You know, at this time, we've had issues, you know, even at the subnational level, you see a state is making X amount and spending almost half of that, you know, for the governor's office. Talk to me. What do you want to see as regards spending with this uh, bill? Uh, is it what do I want to see or what has been released? What, what has, has been, been released and what you want to see? Yeah. What has been released is uh, nothing extraordinary. Is we're still back to the same old regime of defense, getting the lion's share of almost 12% of the budget allocation, infrastructure about 5%, health and social services another 5%, and uh, education about 7.5% 7, 7 uh, uh, of the total allocation. Uh, what we expect to see from uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinimbu, given the fact that uh, he said he wanted to give us renewed hope, is um, likely even more spending, higher amount of allocations or uh, you know monies to be allocated to infrastructure, uh, health, and social services, uh, and other you know fundamentally economic regenerative uh, you know kind of expenditure. Uh, in the last, you know, call it 10 years, from good luck Jonathan's time till now, we've had budget spending uh, in defense. How defensive is Nigeria? How secured is Nigeria? We still have, you know, bandits here and there kidnapping people. We have certain local governments, certain parts of the country that is still under, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the control of these rascals. When we have a military, we have the police, we have all other paramilitary agencies and security agencies that we have. For how long should we continue to spend so much in securing Nigeria? Maybe so you're what saying, we need you're to do we should cut defense spending. Yeah, maybe what we need to do is to interrogate what are the causes of this insecurity. Probably there is a nexus between poverty and insecurity. Probably if we water the soil, if we empower the masses, we will take out 
the bandits from the bush, we will take out the Boko Haram from their enclaves and be able to reduce the level of insecurity. Maybe, maybe we need to have a bit of a paradigm shift to tangentially move from just buying arms and ammunition to saying, wait a minute, let me retreat. What do I need to do in order that we can reduce you know, this level of insecurity? Remember, let uh, President Musa Radua, Shehu uh, Omar Musa Radua, of blessed memory, did try that with the Niger Delta militants. I said, guys, let me give you an olive branch. Instead of doing this destruction, why don't I incentivize you? Why don't I make you productive so that, you know, the oil well, the pipelines, and the environment could be good enough for, uh, you know, for economy to, to strive? What did we witness? Obviously, if Omar Musa Radua didn't implement the amnesty program and the, the follow-up of you know, what he did to the Niger Delta Militia, we probably wouldn't have had an oil industry today in Nigeria. So what you would like to see in this spending, cut defense spending. Yeah. Where are we taking all that money to? Health, infrastructure, education. I mean, we could do with 5% of, of the budget to maintain the armed forces and other, you know, paramilitary and security agencies and move that money to health, infrastructure, and education. In any case, President Bola Ametunumbu did say in his speech that there is going to be a new mechanism of funding education. We still have but what we, are seeing, what we are seeing is allocation of so much money to education, and when the federal government, remember, the, the national the subnationals, both the state and the local government, they have areas where they are supposed to concentrate. Why should the center even be spending so much uh, on education when it is supposed to target, at best, the tertiary education? Uh, you know, the secondary schools, the primary schools are supposed to be under the subnationals. So we, we need to look at these things and we need to be careful. Sometimes uh, President Bola Metunumbu makes statement and you wonder, is that statement properly, uh, you know, interrogated to exactly know what does he mean? How does he intend to achieve uh, uh, some of those uh, pronouncements? Because I'm looking at the student loans and I'm still trying to wrap my head um, around how that's really going to work, you know, in Nigeria at this point. But um, talk to me now about cost of governance because, you know, I'm, not, I'm imagining if I was um, in so much debt, you know, at some point I would trim some of my expenditure in some parts that I feel like it's not, you know, productive. What would you like to see when it comes to cutting costs of governance in Nigeria? God will bless you abundantly for, for this question. And amen. I say amen. <laughs> uh, listen, what we expected, and personally what I expected to see, was a budget that is extremely lower in deficit. Because fundamentally there are two, three things that President Bola, Bola Ahmed Tinubu should have considered in producing this budget. Number one, he's removed oil subsidy. And therefore there is massive amount of money coming into the Federation account. Number two, following closely to that, the exchange rate harmonization has made the government to rake in even more nairas. Number three, what he should have done is not just to be on rhetorics that we want to do to get value for money, but the cost of governance needs to be significantly, massively and rapidly reduced. Without doing so, you are indebted. We are a debtor nation, and yet we are spending so much. The Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria allows him to have minister from each state, which means 36 ministers. Today we have 48 ministers. Are you really, really serious? You are indebted and you are having robust you know, appointees? 
the number of special assistants, special advisors are gradually going to be even more than the number of ministers. Where are we going to source the money to sustain this? Even, and you are talking about need, blocking the leakages. Even though we, we need a, a lot of brains to solve the problems on ground right now. Listen to me. We don't need a lot of brains. Okay. We need egghead, quality materials, two, three, five good guys that can run this system. What are we talking about? You need somebody to run the education. You need somebody to run the budget and planning. You need somebody to be a, a superintendent, a kind of monitoring and evaluation that will make sure that whatever I set out to achieve, I am able to achieve it and not just uh, talking for talking's sake. Do we need 110 you know, persons to run this economy? To the best of my knowledge, no. If you have a country 15, of 200 million people, over 200 million. Listen, with technology, if you leverage on technology and you leverage on quality materials, don't go for quantity. When you are looking for, you know, people that will deliver, you need what? You need just quality materials, egghead. We have quite a number of people trained in the best institutions of the world. Call it Cambridge University, call it Harvard, call it University of Lagos, call it Bayer University, call it Insuka University. You know, we have quality materials, homegrown, that can deliver the best of the very best. And that is why, because we have these quality materials, that is why America, Canada, Europe, Everybody is coming to Nigeria to do what? To steal our talent. If we don't have the talent, will they be employed in Canada? Even this, the Japa syndrome that is so much, uh, you know, discussed in it Nigeria. It shows that we Canada. have something. It shows we have something. And we're not, you know, what the thing you are looking for, Shokoto Ide, you are Shokoto. So that, that is the, 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 the issue. So I sincerely believe we don't need too many people. My brother... United States of America has how many population? 300 million. How many ministers do they have? 15, 20. How many does? How many advisors does uh, uh, you know Biden has? You you don't need this retinue. It's just job for the boys. They've helped me to win election, so I need to. Uh, carry them along so that they can and get that's something. Costing and, the and, and that is so costing much. the country for so much. And we can do, and I'm still repeating, we can do with far, far less of the cost we are spending in maintaining and sustaining, you know, the governance structure that we have. And, and if we continue at this rate, what do you see? We are doomed. We are doomed. The moment that you are spending on consumption is always higher than you are spending on investment, regenerative investment. You are doomed. And if only you are even spending your income, it's even better. But we are borrowing. You can't spend to, 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 yeah, yes, we are, but that's what we are doing. Right. The federal government is borrowing to pay salaries. Must we carry the quantum of staff we are having? We, we shouldn't, particularly when you can ill afford it. If you are spending your money, it's even better. But we have reached a point where we are borrowing to sustain our ostentatious consumptions. So we what you'd like to see is cutting the cost of governance we, we, significantly. 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 Yeah. So much to unpack there. Thank you so much for coming, Mr. Idris uh, Schreiber, economist. Uh, join us right here in the studio. It was great having your perspective. And uh, definitely, uh, I hope, you know, going forward, we, we can, you know, cut a significant amount of when it comes to um, government uh, spending at this point. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Cost thank of government. Thank, thank you for having, great me. having you. Thank you. All right, so the Financial, uh, Financial Reporting Council says it is set to release a new strategy for corporate governance to ensure maximum compliance for Nigeria's public and private sector. Chief Executive Officer of the, of the FRC, Mr. Rabiu uh, Lowe, was made this known to the Stakeholder Engagement and Media Roundtable, explained that a new public sector code will be unveiled in the first quarter of next year as the agency undergoes transformation. Take a listen. In financial, we've seen concerning evidence everywhere in businesses and also in public uh, institutions 
the reason why we need to really help our game, you know, when it comes to financial reporting and corporate governance. And that's why, as the apex regulatory body that is mandated to actually look at this area, we also need to coordinate ourselves and come up with um, uh, clear strategies. And those strategies are in four folds. We talked about digitization, we talked about operational excellence, we talked about stakeholder engagement, and um, we talked about enforcement. Enforcement is going to be key in the things that we will do very, very loudly uh, going forward. We want to make sure that we hold to account those who are responsible for delivering the standards and the codes that we have set. We want to make sure that uh, we ask questions, we want to make sure that we uh, uh, go out there to actually embed our regulatory oversight. At the end of the day, this will come back to us uh, as a nation by attracting foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment, only when investors can rely and they see our financial statement as credible. It's, uh, it's a thing that as a regulator, we need to continually uh, uh, work with businesses to ensure that this new language of business is embedded. Uh, most businesses, uh, especially the big businesses, they have actually adopted IFRS fully, but we see improvement opportunities in how medium-sized uh, businesses can uh, up their game when it comes to this adoption. So we continuously see the opportunities for improvement in this area. And Nigeria's logistics, uh, Korea, and transport sector is valued at uh, 3 trillion naira. But experts in the field of um, Korea and uh, transport management say they're not getting the attention needed from the Nigerian government as the sector remains uh, relatively untapped on a global scale. Well, joining us now is Precious uh, Didiji, marketing manager at AAJ Express. Uh, great to have you on the show. Good morning. Yeah, so we've seen the, the president talk, talking about, you know, getting our economy to a one trillion, you know, dollar economy. We've been talking a lot about getting exports, you know, be, uh, becoming a producer nation, move, moving from consumer to pr producer. Um, looking at the logistics sector, you know, at this point, is this sector ready to service that kind of economy? Yes, thank you so much for having me here today. Yes, yeah, so um, that question is a yes and no. So to some extent, based on what we are doing currently, we are ready to take it on. But again, we need to also um, service some things, put some, some policies in place, put some structures, some infrastructure to be able to do that. Right. Okay. So currently, the, we are not doing so much in terms of export, and that's because we are not even consuming our own products, not stock of exporting. So a lot of times, you see people prefer things from abroad, and if we don't even change that mindset to start with, people should start developing interests and preferences for things that are made here. We can't even talk about exportation. But at the end of the day, taking a product from point A to point B, okay. most of the times there are issues you know, okay. with that. And I, sometimes, you know, when you get to order stuff online, <laughs> yes, I there are issues when sometimes you don't get your, your products at a particular time you'd expect it. Sometimes you see the riders have to go in the mm -hmm. wee hours of the night. What's the cause of that? So there are a lot of factors to that and um, I would start with um, the, the logistics industry also needs help. So a lot of times when we direct some innovations, some um, government interventions at some certain industry, we do not really consider the entire value chain. Take, for example, the agricultural industry. If we keep um, if you keep giving supplies to the primary producers without looking at the entire value chain, they will keep having the same problems. The middlemen will keep ripping them off. Logistics will keep having issues from either the, the, what's it called, the security agencies and things around. Even road infrastructure is another, another major problem that they always have. So if you're sending something from Ikeja to Badagri, for example, see the road infrastructure. And that could be a multiplier's effect on the logistics industry. And how are you guys, you know, managing, you know, all of that at this point? You know, because at the end of the day, the, the, the producer will need to get that product, you know, to the consumer. Talk to me about, you know, petrol subsidy removal. We've seen the price of fuel. How is that, you know, impacting the industry at this time? 
Okay, so I'll take your first question. I see your question as in two faces. Right. So the first, I feel like logistic companies should be consultants to their businesses. So a lot of times, when business owner comes to our store or any of our locations, we do a consulting. We do like a session. We even put some people on retainer. You send things two times daily for a week. You send things monthly. Let's have let's help you reduce cost, and let's plan your route such a way that. We don't have to incur so much costs, and you have efficiency. Of course, the petrol subsidy has really impacted the logistics industry, so we're trying to cushion the effect by reducing our, the, the, the price to the final consumers. Well, of course, it's taking a hit on us. We're trying to reduce overhead as much as possible to stay balanced so that the final consumers do not take so much heat. And not just even the final consumers, the business owners, a lot of times, those that pay for the logistics are the final consumers. So if I have to buy a cup of parfait for two five, and they're delivering from Lekki and I'm at Ikeja, let's take, for example, it used to be 1,000 Naira. Now it's 2,000 Naira. I'd rather buy from, I'll just walk into a street. So it means the person at Lekki would have a reduced number of They've clients. lost business. They've lost business. So we also protect the business owners by keeping the margin a bit um, low, so that they can also keep. Because I've, I've, I've also, you know, tried to, you know, get cake delivered, you know, from say Lekki now. Okay. And they tell me delivery fee is about ten thousand naira. And I'm like, how much is the cake? Why can't Even I get the cake it? Is expensive, <laughs> but why can't I get it around? So, what do you see, you know, going forward? What, what would you like to see, you know, in terms of policy to help this industry, so the businesses can get, you know, their products to to the consumers. There are a lot of things we can do, and we need to regulate um, some the, the workers of the industry. Take, for example, a lot of logistic companies, I mean, almost all the logistics companies have issues with the gap between the riders and the company's management. So a lot of times people feel they can just do whatever they want to do. And we saw what happened when um, this popular, I, I wouldn't want to mention the name, right. a logistic company had an issue with their founder, and... You saw the riders take up the bike and sew them off. People ran away with the bikes, different things happening. So we first need a sensitization of some sort and a proper training, government-backed training, so that people can know that these people are just in business to serve people. They're not, they're not the, they don't have a money-producing factory. They're in business. And if they run out of business, you would also be out of a job. So the sensitization amongst people not to be... Um, there's this word I'm trying to find. Entitled. entitled. A lot of Nigerians right. are entitled. We just feel that the company should be paying so much more than they are paying me. They are using me. Not knowing that it's not even as crystal clear as you, as you think it is. You know, there's a lot that goes into logistics. Right. I can imagine definitely that um, with the cost of living crisis, employees will want so much at this time. Thank you so much uh, for Thank coming on. Precious Adedeji, Marketing Manager, um, AAJ Express. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's uh, get a quick check on the FX market now. See the Naira gained uh, yesterday the official window. Naira at about 6.1% to 831 Naira 47, uh, coupled to the USD at the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange market. The intraday high recorded was 1,159 Naira to the dollar, while the intraday low was at 700 Naira uh, to the dollar. Uh, representing a wide spread of about 459 uh, Naira to the dollar. According to data obtained from the official um, NAFM uh, window, Forex turnover at the close of trading was at $140.06 million. So that's how Naira closed uh, yesterday. We're looking out for the close today. But looking at other markets now, we have uh, Willie Bong. Uh, to bring us uh, the details there for the equities market. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. So we're quite bullish on the market, I see. Yeah, right. Now it's gaining. So we need time strong. to pump the market. Right. You know, it's bringing that, that money into the market. So yeah. let's see how the market performed yesterday to see if that trickled into the equity space. We did see that positive close for the equities market. It reversed the losses seen on Tuesday. Bargain hunting in Saplat up 10% yesterday, and Nestle drove the market. The all share index 0.34% higher. We see the market cap back to the 39 trillion Naira mark. Now, we did see that news from Sepla saying it's on the verge of concluding the $1.3 billion. ExxonMobil 
asset purchase. We're going to see investors are probably in the frenzy right now to get their hands on Saplat. But we'll see how that goes for them. Now, we'll see month to date and year to date gains at 3.3% and 39.1%. Now, total volume, let's look at the, volume, the, the, the turnover chart for yesterday. We did see that downtrend for the volume, that 2.55% drop closed at 360.60 million units, traded valued at 6.61 billion naira, that's up 17.65%. Deals all concluded in about 6,581. Let's look at the sectors. Yesterday we did see banking counter down, really red for them. Now, consumer goods is up, industry that's up. Based Nestle did that magic. Industrial goods flat in yesterday's trading session. Insurance also bullish yesterday. And oil and gas, the star of the show yesterday, 6.06% up. And that's because Seplet gained 10%. Now, oil and gas has been unchanged for days now. We were wondering what was happening there, if they were going to make any move ready ahead. But right now, they came with a bang. 6.06% is a big one for the market. Now, GTCO was the most traded stock by volume yesterday. But we're going to bring in... El Nasser Asotia Naolo is investment analyst with Main Street Capital who is going to share more insights about the market. But first of all, we're going to look at the budget and see how the equities market can help the government with that. Good morning, El Nasser. It's good to have you on the program. Morning, Will. Thanks for having me. And so we've seen the, uh, the budget here, the, the breakdown of the budget. We've seen for education, 2.18 trillion. That's 7.9% of the budget. We see defense and security infrastructure, which is quite interesting, uh, 1.32 trillion, 5% of the budget. How do you see the, the, the governments coming into the equities market? How do you see the equities markets playing a role in the government's uh, uh, um, channel of raising funds? Uh, well, when it comes to um, um, the government trying to raise funds, we know that if they're trying to raise funds, they most likely would want to keep um, interest rates down. Uh, so and then one, that ties into MPC, monetary policy rates. Now, we know that uh, we heard that this, um, the government had, uh, should I say, suspended some of the members of the monetary policy committee. Now, when you think about how the monetary policy committee their trend, you know, over the last couple of months, they've been more likely to raise rates. So now you have a government who is that is getting ready to borrow a lot of money, and now they want to change uh, some of these members who have um, a history of raising rates. And now you can kind of draw certain conclusions that okay, I think they would want to keep um, monetary policy rates low for quite a while. Now, if they are keeping monetary policy rates low. When I say low, I mean probably not raising it or not raising it by a lot. Then um, investors don't have a lot more to look forward to in the fixed income space. If rates are not rising in the fixed income, you know, income space, and then we are at a point where oh, um, people are might begin begin to look you know, for dividends next year, then it, it stands to reason that um, a lot of some of those funds, you know, that would have gone into fixed income will start to flow into the equities market. Um, so that's that's just one you know one vertical or one way that um, one major way you know I believe that you know the equities markets will be um, um, impacted by you know the government you know um, their borrowing activities. Now oh, that's interesting to know. But let's look at the uh, major. We can't let go without talking about it. Seplat, which pushed the oil and gas index up more than six percent yesterday. Uh, what do you see uh, this move by Seplat, this expansion? How do you see it impacting the whole of the investment space in the country? Um, there are a couple ways that uh, you know, you know, that it could it could you know um, affect. Um, Investments and even even other things yeah, in the country as well. Um, normally, this may not be as as I wouldn't say important, but in in, in, in a in a more diversified economy, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Uh, but because of our country's reliance on oil, if Seplat is able to you know acquire you know some of those assets and potentially increase you know expand and increase their oil production, uh, then one it could actually now mean. Um, 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 higher revenue, you know, possibly for the government, you know, um, if that happens, then our foreign reserves, you know, which has been on a decline, might see some improvements. If our foreign reserves sees um, see improvements, then that might increase the, the, the government's ability to, uh, quote-unquote, clear off um, 
FX, you know, FX backlog. Um, if they're able to clear off FX backlog, um, then it means more people have access to FX and then rates come down. And if rates come down, then that helps, you know, the entire business space. Of course, we're know? waiting for um, that too. That is we're waiting for that to exactly. help the entire business space because we need more FX influence in the country. And I said, we desperately need that, those dollars. And I know Laddie is okay. right there itching his fingers to grab some of them. But <laughs> we've been talking about it. But thank you so much, Anasa Sotia Naolo, investment analyst with Main Street Capital, for sharing your perspective on Business Morning. Thanks for having me. So, Larry, I didn't bring you in there. Sorry about that. But That's I fine. know you and the FX. All you dollars in. Let, all, all dollars, dollars in. in. All dollars in. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll forget about the details there from the fixed income market and the FT's market. Let's get a sense of what's happening with Bitcoin now. It's uh, well a bit above that 37,500 level. But we're seeing red on the screen uh, right now. Bitcoin down, Ethereum down, BNB down, XRP down. Uh, pockets of green, though, with uh, Dogecoin there, king of the meme coins. That's in the green, uh, but it's, it's, it's a mixed picture. Let's look at the sentiment now. Let's see if it's still a greedy market. Yes, still greedy. 74 points um, over 100 for the fear uh, greed uh, index. So we're getting some breaking news now about Cristiano um, Ronaldo and Binance. Let's bring in Rume um, Ofi now, financial market analyst. Hello, Rume. Good morning. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure you're a big fan of Ronaldo. I know, I know I am, but he's facing a class action lawsuit in the U.S. over his promotion of Binance. That's the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. What are you hearing about this? Yes, uh, this just happened now. Uh, you know, Ronaldo has some partnership with Binance at some point, considering the fact that he has about 850 million users uh, on social media, which influenced the, the whole process of getting people onboarded on the platform. So this class action suit is coming to say that Ronaldo also, in other words, supports uh, the sale of uh, unregistered securities. And uh, this is not uh, actually uh, coming well uh, from uh, those that it's coming from, from the court of Florida right about now. But I really don't think uh, uh, the U.S. have actually had, have gotten a, a clear pathway of what a security and what not a security is. I understand that the U.S. SEC regarding crypto has been a bad loser lately, and they are going all uh, heads on to do all what is possible to make sure that this doesn't look good for the industry. But again, uh, this is coming from Ronaldo's NFT being sold, and a couple of persons made money and all. And going forward, uh, it's being said now that uh, in, the, in the future, celebrities or, or, or stars are going to be disclosing how much of, uh, of a partnership uh, the uh, money is collected at, at some point in time to make sure that this is being uh, very, very clear. So it also goes out to a couple of other uh, people in different parts of the world, even uh, crimes, depends on the project you're supporting. Uh, if, the, if, if, you, if the project is a bad project, for example, I'm not saying Binance is a bad uh, a, a platform, I'm saying that you are going to be brought uh, to account for it. Right. So, right. so much to, to unpack there. And uh, definitely be looking at and tracking how that story uh, ends up. Thank you so much, Rumi Ofi, financial market analyst. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ladi. So that's how the crypto market is looking uh, today. Still a greedy market at this time. Um, that's the show uh, today. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget you can join us again on 1.30 p.m. for Business uh, Incorporated. Also visit www.channelcv.com for more updates. Thank you for watching. From me and the team right here at Lagos HQ, it's bye for now. <laughs>